We're here in the Marion Knott Studios at Chapman University. Our first guest is my partner, Dr. Jay Lee. He's the Medical Director of Electrophysiology at St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange and my colleague at the Orange County Heart Institute and Research Center. Dr. Lee is a pioneer in treating abnormal heart rhythms. The most common is atrial fibrillation, which affects over 6% of the population 65 years or older. Jay, thanks for coming today. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks for having me on. Welcome. You know, atrial fibrillation is a real problem, and I want you to tell us what that is in a second, but it just interferes with people's lives so much. I mean, the emergency room visits, the hospitalizations, the multiple medications that they sometimes have to be on. And I wonder if, you know, you can explain to us, uh, you pioneered this atrial fib fibrillation ablation. What is atrial fibrillation, and what are the various treatments? And specifically, tell us a lot about this, uh, the ablation and what that means. Um, atrial fibrillation is a very complex uh, arrhythmia. It uh, primarily affects uh, the older population, age uh, 65 or greater. Um, it can uh, uncommonly affect uh, younger uh, patient populations. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the atria is the top chamber of the heart, and what happens in atrial fibrillation is that uh, the top chamber becomes uh, disorganized. It sends electrical signals that are completely uh, abnormal, and it creates uh, a very rapid and uh, irregular heart rhythm. When you started training years ago, uh, we had very we had medications, and a lot of them had a lot of side effects. What do you think the role is of uh, this ablation now? I mean, do do you think that patients should go to this immediately? When should they see an electrophysiologist immediately and, and seek this type of treatment, or do you think there's still room for medical treatment first? and then a, the, this treatment that you're going to describe sure, in more detail. Sure. Well, you know, unlike um, our other arrhythmias that we can ablate, uh, atrial fibrillation is still a very uh, complex arrhythmia to uh, successfully ablate. And for that reason, um, we, re we uh, recommend that you take uh, medications first. If the medications are ineffective, uh, ineffective in treating the, uh, the symptoms, then uh, catheter ablation is uh, recommended. How does one know if you have a palpitation? Palpitations are essentially the abnormal, uh, the sensation of an abnormal heart rhythm. So uh, patients may feel their heart fluttering or they may feel their heart uh, pounding or just any abnormal sensation that you may feel in your chest. Do women feel it more than men? I've heard women can have symptoms that aren't as explicit as men's in this right. area. I see a lot of women with uh, palpitations. Uh, they have a wide uh, range of symptoms, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if they're necessarily more uh, likely to experience palpitations, but we do see them equally in women and men. What do you think the biggest cause of atrial fibrillation is? That's a difficult. Uh, atrial fibrillation, we still don't know the uh, cause uh -huh. in most patients. There are some uh, direct uh, links to uh, atrial fibrillation, such as uh, thyroid disease, uh, and hypertension. It appears to be more common with aging. So as you tend to get older, we see the incidence of atrial fibrillation tends to increase. What's the difference between a palpitation and a murmur? A palpitation, like I said, is the uh, sensation of an abnormal heartbeat. A murmur is something your doctor uh, actually uh, will detect, and it's a, an abnormal flow he'll detect by uh, auscultation or listening to your heart. When you explain this procedure to the patient, what do you think the success rate is now? I know you're using this new 3D imaging. I mean, it's right. three-dimensional CT scans, CAT scans, which has dramatically improved your success rate and Absolutely. the ability to do this, but still it's a technically, I know it's a technically challenging ar arrhythmia, not everybody should be doing this. Right. It, it should be somebody very skilled like you with, with great hands yeah. and great insight. Um, when we first started, the success rates uh, back maybe five years ago was probably 60 to 70 percent. And we didn't have any uh, special mapping. We used uh, fluoroscopy and just uh, our traditional catheters. Uh, now, with the advent of this advanced uh, imaging we have with MRIs and CT scans, we're able to uh, much better uh, visualize the different anatomy of, of patients. I usually tell my patients after a, a one-time procedure uh, a conservative uh, success rate of uh, 70 to 80 percent. Well, so that's way up there now from that's years impressive. ago. Yeah. And well, how long does it take to, to do it in your hands, anyway? It takes uh, a full morning, so yeah. we usually uh, take uh, about four hours to do the full procedure. The full procedure, yeah. and you send them home the same day or the next day? Uh, patients will usually stay one night, and they'll be discharged oh. the following morning. When you do this, do you, do, um, the, the MRI and the CAT scan are images are done, and then you 
bring those images like in, into the room where you're doing in the catheterization suite where you're going to do do that that gives you this three-dimensional image where you can tell precise or more precisely where you put the catheter can you show us the catheter what it looks sure, like a little sure. bit this and, is a uh, and what, what the word ablation means sure uh, ablation is essentially um, destroying or desiccating or drying out uh, abnormal uh, heart tissue that creates uh, abnormal electrical disturbances. And so what we can do with our ablation catheter, which I have one right here, is with the tip of our ablation catheter here, we're able to uh, locate the abnormal uh, foci and mm -hmm. uh, ablate and destroy that tissue. Ah. This is a uh, mapping catheter, which is, uh, as you can see, it is uh, like, shaped like a spiral. And we place these into the uh, pulmonary veins, uh, and essentially we're able to map and identify the location of the abnormal impulses. So this is tells you where the impulse is, and that one tells you it, that's the one that ablates it or destroys exactly. it. Exactly. So this directs the energy to the tissue, and this here is the diagnostic uh, mapping catheter. Yeah. And most of these you you do through the the femoral vein. Yes, yeah, so these are done uh, percutaneously. We do them through the uh, vessels in the leg, uh, the femoral vein, and sometimes we use the femoral artery. Uh, we enter the heart. Uh, we per enter uh, the left atrium through a procedure called a transeptal, and we're able to introduce these catheters into the left atrium. Is the patient semi-conscious or totally out for? For this particular ablation, the patients are entirely out. They're, so they're done under general anesthesia, done, so they're not aware of uh, anything that is uh, happening. That is going on. And is this the actual length for, of um, catheter that you would use in a yes, procedure? Yes, exactly. So this huh. will basically reach from the groin of the patient into the patient's heart. All the way heart. into the patient's yeah. heart. Is there any particular habit that you might have noticed that's uh, usual with your patients who have had this particular need for ablation or extra tissue in the sure. heart? I don't think there are any direct habits that um, correlate with this, but mm -hmm. certainly there's certain habits that can make the condition worse. And I think uh, caffeine use, uh, alcohol, uh, certainly can uh, make it worse, and sometimes stressful right. situations can provoke uh, palpitations. Oh, I see. Okay, so anything that would excite you or exactly. speed Sometimes up the metabolism. Sometimes they, they can occur at, during sleep, so you have no uh, oh. control of these things. How does a patient know they have atrial fibrillation? Well, once you have the uh, sensation of uh, palpitations, most patients uh, will either uh, seek help with their, their doctor who will perform an EKG, an electrocardiogram, and there they can make a diagnosis. Um, sometimes if the si symptoms are severe enough, it brings them into the emergency room, and there they'll, they'll be able to diagnose it there. Uh, sometimes it's more difficult to diagnose it, and uh, we have uh, remote monitoring such as Holter monitors and mm -hmm. event monitors uh, that help us to uh, make that diagnosis. What do you think the biggest risk is from atrial fibrillation uh, to the patient? Sure. I tell all my patients uh, when I first meet them, the first and foremost, the biggest risk is the risk of stroke. And uh, essentially, there are, uh, we assess the patient's risk factors for a stroke, and then I, at that time, I'll usually prescribe the appropriate uh, anticoagulation whether it be aspirin or uh, warfarin. And the mechanism is that these top chambers are really just wiggling up there and the blood stagnates along the, uh, along the outside of the chamber and breaks off and goes to the brain and exactly. causes and a, have stroke. a stroke. Exactly. And the longer you're in the irregular rhythm, the higher your risk, risk. is. So presumably. you would say if you're in this irregular, if you think you have this rhythm for 12 hours, 24 hours, when do you think you need to seek um, treatment? Based on some observational studies, uh, we use uh, this number of 48 hours, and uh, we've noticed the earliest uh, time that we've seen a thrombus uh, a clot form is within 48 hours. So we have stroke, we have feeling of shortness of breath. What, what other symptoms may you, what other some problems Some patients may, uh, may experience chest discomfort or chest pain. Others oh. become very lightheaded, and some patients can actually uh, pass out and lose consciousness. Yeah. Really? If, if they have lost consciousness and they've been brought to the ER, um, would an emergency uh, doctor know that that was the cause, that they were having atrial fib fibrillation? Yes. Well, it depends. It, most of the time, if you're, in, if you're still in atrial fibrillation, the doctor there would be able to diagnose that. But the atrial fibrillation is very difficult. There are times when uh, it can be intermittent and oh. uh, patients may actually present to the emergency room and their heart rhythm may correct. Oh. And the, so the doctors have no idea what right. uh, caused the problem. Oh. Other times it can be uh, permanent or constant, and th in that situation they're able to make that diagnosis. 
Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, which I can tell you since you know, we've been together and your success rate with this has been, your ability to do this ablation study is, I mean, far better than, I mean, not just because you're my partner, but far better <laughs> than many, many other people in the country. I mean, you've been world-class electrophysiologist and especially in atrial fibril fibrillation ablation. And I mean, it really makes a huge difference in patients' lives. If you can do this, get them off of drugs, I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge uh, leap in technology. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, our management of it has been very difficult with their medications. There are yeah. a lot of side effects. And so it's very difficult to treat this condition. And certainly, uh, it makes it very rewarding when we're able to actually cure yeah. uh, a condition like this. Great. Well, well, thanks so much for coming. It was a great, great interview. And uh, I think thanks, uh, people learned a lot. Thank, Thank you, you very much.